All right. Good morning. We're on to our second talk, and uh, next speaker is. Uh, you've been here a few times at the yeah. Packet Hacking Village talks. Get it here, Barry. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to my presentation. My name is Gita Ziabari. Uh, I'm coming from Verizon, working as a senior consultant engineer software developer. And uh, I'm going to talk about how to tune automation to avoid false positive. So I'm going to talk about techniques to design a reliable automated tool, introducing threat intelligence feeds, and to how to avoid false positive when we generate automated tools and feeds. Techniques to design a reliable automated tool. So there are many different reasons that automation is needed in cybersecurity. There are massive amount of data that needs to be analyzed on an hourly basis, and action is needed. So uh, accelerated response time, consistency, scalability, efficiency, risk reduction, simplified IR process, empowering users, they are all good reasons that we do need to have automation in cybersecurity. However, um, since we have large amount of data and all of us are very much busy, um, bad ideas could lead to false positive, and false positive is always bad, especially in cybersecurity. So automation needs to be done with intelligence. By intelligence, I mean let's just consider creating an automated tool that is pretty much simple to use because uh, no one is going to be interested to learn a new tool that is very much complicated and it is, uh, it's designed to have a lot of, let's say, GUI pages with lots of uh, maintenance and everything that it just like takes a long time. And think about five years. You are creating an automated tool and you move on. If you want to maintain it all the time and something breaks all the time, then it's not going to be usable. Make it user-friendly so that uh, the threat researchers who are basically the target to use the uh, automated tool, they buy it and they start using it right away. Um, make it like have some documented uh, does, uh, design framework and think about whoever is going to inherit it, the framework. It might be even open source. You may des uh, decide to publish it. So uh, think about those that are going to use and inherit the code. Uh, most of researchers in cybersecurity and analysts, they already have a framework that they are based on it and they are actually using it. So if you want to say that, yeah, I have this created, just like this automated tool, it's pretty cool and it's just like adding these many features to uh, your analyzers and it's so fast and everything, uh, they are going to hesitate using it because they already have something that they are using and switching from one um, source that is actually working to a new one is going to be a bit hard. So uh, make it We have to put this on you, sorry. Okay. I do apologize. That's okay. So uh, make it somehow that you guys can hear me. <laughs> That's good. That's because I can. <laughs> That's much better. So uh, make it somehow uh, with minimum dependencies. First of all, to other servers. Again, if you want to publish it in GitHub, uh, people who are going to download your tool, they are not going to have the same servers that you have. So um, make it easily integratable to any platform that uh, is being used by different analysts, by different groups, by different companies. It just doesn't matter. Just make it as much as possible independent with possibility of integration. Uh, when it comes to planning the automation, again, simplicity is the most important thing because uh, imagine that you could create an automated tool, a script, that could be run through cron job in background, through command line, or you have a pretty nice UI. Um, UI, believe me, it just like requires a lot of maintenance and uh, there are so many patches that you have to just like upgrade. There are so many dependencies and uh, analysts, they are not going to like it, like threat researchers. They have to just like go to this website, they have to access it, and then they have to uh, log into it. There are so many layers involved. So 
just try to make it simple, cron job. If you can do it through cron job, then do it cron through cron job. Um, some of us like Python, some of us like Pair, some of us like PHP. If you have a framework that is already designed, let's say doing Python, then stick to Python. And do not just switch because you just get bored from one language and you feel that the other language actually has more um, functionality for doing this tool that you're, for making this tool that you're making. Make it simple, avoid dependent processes because uh, we all know that when we have dependent processes, if just one of them breaks, then everything is going to be broken. If you are busy working on other stuff, they are going to ask you to fix it and you don't know where to start. What is actually broken to fix it? And if you have to really have a um, chain of processes, then uh, use some monitoring systems like Nagios so that it just like a start reporting you if something goes down and if it goes down make some uh, really really like easy uh, scripts like a line of uh, command uh, if it goes down like if your MongoDB is down send me the logs restart it so that your automated tool is not going to be broken forever till you or someone actually finds out what's going on uh, in cybersecurity, we are actually lucky developers because we do not have QA in most of cases to QA our code. So that's a good part and a bad part. But we have to be our own QA, especially because we are actually um, having a massive amount of data that needs to be analyzed and performance testing is very important. So make sure to have a platform for yourself for uh, being able to, a test framework actually, to be able to test your own code. That is very, very important. I know that we all do unit testing and feature testing. Performance testing is needed and we do need to consider it. I just uh, quickly jump to threat intelligence feeds. Uh, that's the area that I was working in the past few years. And uh, by cyber uh, by uh, threat intelligence, I mean indicator-based threat intelligence feeds, such as domains, URLs, IP addresses, hashes, email addresses, and whatever you want to consider as an indicator. So uh, threat intelligence feeds, you can get it from third-party feeds. Like uh, there are some open sources, there are some community-based, based on the circle of trust. Uh, commercial ones, you have to pay, good money. <laughs> and the government-based, the internal feeds are also valuable. You get feedbacks from analysts, that these are basically the uh, feeds that I could pass you and the indicators that I could pass you. Uh, or you create some automated data mining tools, or you use the ones that uh, are available and start mining data from the data um, and the, from the logs that you have. You just generate it. How many of you guys are using threat intelligence feeds? How many of you are happy with the result? <laughs> None. I was expecting it, actually. So the reason is that it's just like poor quality control, overlapped indicators, false positives, noise. It's just like massively creating noise. And um, most of the companies, they would rather not to use it rather than using it because it's just like generating noise. And you don't know where is the source coming or if you can trust it or not. Now, um, generating high quality feeds is possible, believe me. <laughs> um, the first, first step that you need to take action is actually having a database. Don't take everything from fly, from different sources, make it to like a JSON or CSV format and then export it to whoever you want to. Have everything in your database. In that case, you would be able to apply quality and you have control on the indicators that you're ingesting in the database. What needs to be done is do dupl duplicating, uh, whitelisting, filtering, scoring, and aging. If you are inserting an indicator, check your database and see if it exists in the database. If it does, then update it based on the source, based like aging, scoring, just like um, make, make some changes, but do not reinsert it. When you want to export the feed, it's very important to also do uh, deduplicating so that you do not have duplicate indicators. 
White listing, it could be done through third party sources, it could be done uh, through internally. Uh, third party sources, there are some sources that are available, like external sources. Some of them are free, some of them you have to pay some money. Uh, most of them are based on the popularity of the indicators. For example, the websites that are being most visited by different countries, they are being introduced as white list. Uh, try to scoop up just like the top 1,000. And even if you are considering the top 1,000, um, let's say, domains, it's still um, apply some filters. Filtering is very important, actually, in fits. Because uh, imagine that the uh, adult uh, content-based domains are also pretty much popular. And some of them are even in the top 50 uh, like indicators. And they are not necessarily good or like trustable. They are just popular. So as quantity increases, consider that the possibility of having false positive also increases. Uh, you get feedback from your peers, your analysts, your customers uh, about voice uh, indicators that actually are false, false positive. Immediately quarantine them, have an automated tool to check the results through different sources, and then whitelist them immediately. Everything has to be done in automatic way because you cannot just like go through every single indicator uh, one by one. And believe me, one bad indicator could result in many hits, like 100K plus. So when I said that we don't have QA and we have to be our own QA, uh, have your framework, the test framework, and start testing your feeds that you're generating, write a script, see the number of matches and have a statistic about the indicators that, you're, uh, that, that are matching a lot of hits. And then quarantine them, analyze them through another source and see if they are actually uh, false positive or they are true positive. Immediately whitelist them. So you get the data, a big amount of data in indicators. You apply whitelisting from any source, internal, external. You have a better data. It's not enough, though. You do need to do some scoring. So imagine that you are getting, um, you, you are using this many sources, like open sources, different sources, sources coming from your internal or external, and uh, the indicators that are being reported repeatedly through different di different sources. It means that they are actually happening, and they have a better chance to be malicious. So their score is actually higher than the ones that uh, are coming from a single source. So they should have a higher score. Uh, a score of sources is also important. Um, check out the uh, results that you're getting, the alerts that is being generated, and check out the number of false positives that you're getting from different sources. Have a statistic. Again, here, a test framework is needed if you want to analyze the um, sources and the score of the sources that are coming. Um, the ones that are noisier and they are generating more false positive, they need to be um, less scored. And the ones that are uh, more reliable, they need to be higher scored. Now, the result that you are getting today may be different one week from now. So again, you need to have an automated uh, way for uh, getting these scored of especially the sources and also the common number of sources that um, are uh, reporting an um, indicator. And and tune the algorithm somehow that gives you the right um, results. Um, this is just like an algorithm. You get the indicators, see if it exists in database. If it doesn't exist, it then uh, score it based on the uh, source that you have obtained. If it does exist, then um, check the common sources, the quality, the quantity of the common sources, and also the quality of the sources. In this phase, right here, you can apply many different scoring methods. Let's say if you have access to the malware type, then you can start scoring the malware type as well. So you can just apply intelligence based on your needs. If you have the malware type, malware type could be added here. So filtering, um, we just talked about like whitelisting, uh, scoring. There are so many different methods that you could apply in this um, phase for applying more filtering to have a better filtered data. Um, there are some tools available that you could just like check the indicator through trusted parties that they have access to many AV engines, and you can get a report from them and see what is the number of positives for this particular indicator. Uh, when you want to build up the queries, be as specific as possible. More attributes, it means that you can um, have a better database 
of uh, indicators and you can easily search on whatever you are uh, um, interested. So make sure that uh, the critical attributes that you're having are uh, indicators the indicator itself, the type of it, if it is a hash, URL, domain, IP address, email, any, anything. Uh, unique index based on the sources, so that if an alert get generated, you would know that, okay, this is coming from this source or these sources. So you have a control for the nubbing thing for the algorithm that I just mentioned you to avoid false positive. Uh, a list of sources, the score that is given currently, uh, date of insertion, malware type, and age. So when it comes to feeds, you cannot say that, okay, I have my feed that I built like a week ago and now it's just like this is what I have and I'm going to submit it. It needs to be updated. Ingestion should happen in real time and you need to apply the intelligence, the algorithms that we just covered and export the data at least on an hourly basis to have a real time, um, almost real time I would say feeds. You could be selective. Now you have the pool of indicators based on different criteria that you defined and the attributes. Now you can select what you are interested and actually interest you. Like if you want to select the type of indicator to be only hash, you can apply it. If you want based on the malware type, then you can just like extract it. If you want combination of the stuff that is happening, let's say the most recent indicators that have been seen through different networks, you can just like uh, extract the information in the database. Aging is also another thing that is very much important and needs to be considered. Uh, you don't want to save lots of indicator in your database and then um, get an um, indicator that is not happening in any database anymore. So as you see the uh, indicators and as you're ingesting the indicators in your database, you need to age them properly. And um, set it based on the malware type, based on the scoring, set it some, somehow from like um, 60 days or like a little bit more, and then age them out if they are not being seen so you don't have like something that is not happening uh, in the network anymore um, in your feeds. Um, so as I mentioned, like you get your feeds and indicators from different sources, from third party sources, from internal sources. Um, you do apply some intelligence, whitelisting, scoring, filtering, aging, and then you can select your feeds based on the criteria that you're interested. Now, imagine that you want to have high priority feeds that are actually very critical and needs to be um, taken care of immediately. You can just like have your alerts based on these feeds, like very high. You can define medium um, uh, uh, priority feeds or like low confidence. And uh, with all these criteria that I just told you, you are going to have a better result, less false positive, selecting true positive, and um, you do need to have aging, uh, aging for having a current uh, indicators and the uh, sort of like a real-time results. Do you have any questions? 